what I find simply amazing as a pianist or as a music scholar is to see how the piano rose from those small wooden pianos to this incredible feat of technology that we have here that actually set the stage for, for literally everything that we associate with the piano. And it was happening right in the 1840s and 50s with children. What do you think these pianos have to say to us today? What is art? It's something that makes us feel better. Something through its beauty that makes us feel better. And even if the beauty of that art is an expression of pain, still makes us feel better. A contradiction here, substantially. And to get to that capability for that expression required transformation of the piano. This piano is an exemplar of that transformation at the time. It lacks only overstraining to be, and an error action to be essentially identical to the modern piano. It also says that what we think is an archaic age and a consciousness lacking in modern attributes is an illusion to us. And this shows it right here, the ability to produce that kind of beautiful music. Essentially, the second design iteration of Chick Reeves uh, was built probably around 1855 or 1856, perhaps as late as 1857. The serial number has been obliterated, but through certain uh, technical features and through some the, the uh, project that went on the piano, we can roughly identify when the piano was built. The bridge itself is a vertically laminated bridge with a cap. Bedwood bridge in the base. And the long vertically laminated bridge in the treble, a feature of that chicory long antedated other manufacturers uh, in the use of, although this is not widely understood. Uh, what is it that makes a straight strung piano worthy of being a musical instrument? Uh, in my opinion, the torques in the board and the placement of the bridges reduce the twisting of the board and the downbearing pressures applied across the scale. And this leads to a smoother, more elegant type sound. The overall voice of the instrument, although certainly acceptable for any kind of concert work, in my opinion, is a little bit less than an orchestra piano in terms of power. But the clarity is essentially superior to any orchestra piano. Um, the piano has an action, which is called brown action. This is a single escapement action that is not an error action with a double escapement, but it functions quite well if it's properly regulated and it's an extremely modular and advanced construction system. In a moment we will take that action to the bench and take a look at it and see how it works. Now we're looking at the key set of the action and the frame. This is not like a normal modern frame where you can take the screws of the brackets out and lift the stack off the key set. Chickering has a modular system, highly advanced for manufacturing in my opinion. The function of the system greatly depends upon the various felts and coverings being the proper dimensions. Many technicians, I think, are frustrated by trying to work on a brown action because there are so few points of adjustment. One of those points of adjustment is the let-off rail 
that rail is removable. Another point of adjustment is the under hammer system we just showed you. Uh, and the other is the back check. On any piano, for example, an upright, uh, it's necessary to regulate the loss motion to prevent uh, loss of transmission of power through the joint into the hammer butt. The equivalent on a uh, brown action is the jack and under hammer contact point. That is felted and covered with leather just like an upright action. There is no adjustment for the key, uh, I'm sorry, there is no adjustment for loss motion as there is no cap stand. The jack is pinned and glued to the key. To make that work, it is critical, absolutely vital, that the angle of the key uh, be correct in the piano itself. And that, of course, is achieved by having the proper back rail claw, something very, very lacking in the work of many technicians, the proper thickness, which elevates the back of the key to the correct uh, height, and then the correct level at the front of the keys. The only way to adjust uh, repeating of the jack or to eliminate lost motion is to raise the key slightly higher or lower. That implies the correct dimensions for the back rail flaw and the proper key height at the front of the key. Other rails in the piano, the hammer rail is modular and lifts out. The same happens with what's called the under hammer rail. It lifts out as well. But I can't stress enough how critically important the proper dimensions of the coverings of the bearing surfaces are as there are no points of adjustment. The factory themselves adjust these rails with small shims as the rails are placed down on paper shims, placed down on the brackets to tweak it uh, this way or that. The scale 19 in there, a 7 foot 7 piano, the difference in string height from the left side to the right height the right side is a 32nd of an inch. That's how precisely made the tolerances and the drilling of the egg wraps are in the system. For this system to work well, you first must have the bearing surfaces and the dimensions of the parts correct. Then the key frame itself must, the keys must be at the proper height at the back rail and the front rail, as I said. Now we'll look at a look quickly at the amazingly contemporary nature of the key set itself. The balance rail pins are brass, they're 146 thousandths. The front rail pins are also brass, they are 146 thousandths. The key has a key shoe, it's difficult to see here. It also has a key button. It has as well a, a block for the back checks. These are highly advanced systems people actually don't associate with chickering because at, some, at one point they decided not to use those features. Uh, but those basically were in existence long before any competitors of chickering had even established themselves as viable piano companies. So the, the action itself and the key has its unique characteristics, but it is a single escapement action. Brown's patent asserts that the spring, which is attached to the under lever, which we could sort of call a repetition spring, facilitates the return of the uh, jack under the nest in the under hammer, which it does. It's attached to the under hammer and attached to the jack. And it has a function very similar to the, the uh, function of a repetition lever in an air, air hard, Hertz air hard action. We're looking at the parts, a whipping and of course a hammer and shank uh, for a modern aeroid type action. You can see the differences from the earlier view of the under hammer. The equivalent of the under hammer is this repetition lever and the spring which dri drives the hammer up and pulls the j and forces the jack to recycle as well. The under hammer with its spring on the aeroid action does the same thing. The great difference in functionality between these two, or from, a te from a technician's point of view, is the ability to adjust these functions. And there's more work in them, of course, but the, of course, the repetition lever being able to be adjusted, the jack height, the uh, escapement, which does have a, an escapement lever, uh, the jack can be adjusted on the 
aeroid, uh, uh, the uh, brown action as well. But there are many more points of adjustment on the modern action, which in that regard make it superior to the brown action. The brown action is far superior, though, in terms of its assembly. It's modular. The three rails are screwed down to a static frame. If the covering's on there, that means wear are not too bad, then the interactions of the parts are already controlled except for the escapement and the checking. So now we'll look at an action model itself. You can see the hammer rise as the key is depressed. The knuckle, or what's called the roller, uh, pivots on the repetition lever and brings the hammer assembly up. At a certain point, something called double escapement takes place. That means this lever is, uh, ceases to be able to be lifted because it impacts on a screw called the drop screw here and the jack begins to move at essentially the same time. So you have the escapement of the knuckle from the lever and, uh, and from the uh, top of the jack. This is the double escapement action. So the principal difference between the Erard type action and the Brown action is the motion uh, of the key being communicated to the knuckle in a way it is, to, I'm sorry, to the hammer assembly in a way that's very similar to an upright action, quite similar. You just don't have the cap stand to adjust the height for, so that the jack can return or to eliminate lost motion. Um, and that is, once again, I can't emphasize enough, critically dependent on the wear in the coverings on the under hammer. To sum up the unique features of the, this particular chickering, it does not have the plate uh, imprisoned, as it were, under the rim. The pin block is, but the plate is not, so it's possible to remove the plate without cutting apart the rim. This is how virtually all subsequent pianos have been built. Uh, the piano has a greater than 90 degree corner on the left side, a feature that sometimes is attributed to other manufacturers when in fact Chickering was, had long since used this. It has of course the plate, the agraphs, and the vertically laminated bridge. Um, its unusual feature which helps to date it is the grain orientation and hence the, the angle made relative to the, to the spine the long side of the piano. Subsequent chickerings, a few years later, uh, were built with the more conventional grain orientation along the bridge. Also, the vertically laminated bridge, as I've said several times, and the essentially, quintessentially modern key set, 1855-1856. There's nothing different about that key set than you would uh, expect to see on a piano. For example, here is about a 1980 Baldwin SD-10. It has the pins, the, uh, it does not have key glide, something Chickering did not use, uh, but it has the pins, the key button, a key shoe, that is the maple insert to stabilize the part of the key that bears against the balance rail pin, and I'm not sure if this piano has a block for the back, back checks. Yes, it does. So it's got all the same details that this piano made essentially 130 years prior as as well. So these are interesting pianos uh, and the combination of straight stringing and these other details produces an instrument with a truly uh, melodic beautiful legato and the ability for a beautiful melodic line which artists will demonstrate shortly.